Chocolate lovers, today we have a brief history of chocolate, how it's made, a reading from the dragon with the chocolate heart and how to make super cool chocolate writing and pictures. Today's video is looking at one of my most favourite things on planet Earth. It is chocolate. I love the stuff. Dark chocolate, milk chocolate, chocolate with um, nuts in, ganache, pralines, all chocolate. I just love them. Truffles. Anyway, I could go on and on about chocolate, but I won't or we'll be here forever. But so let's kick off with a brief history. Um, thousands of years before the chocolate that you or I know, as early as 1900 BC in Mexico, they discovered that they could cultivate the rainforest's cocoa plant and using a process of fermentation and roasting and grinding, they would produce a bitter tasting paste which had mood enhancing qualities. It was mixed with water, vanilla, honey, chili and other spices to create a drink that supposedly had aphrodisiac qualities. Um, a millennium later, the Mayans claimed it was the drink of the gods. Seeds were even used as currency because it was thought of as so valuable. Similar drinks are still made today in the south of Mexico. And we do like hot chocolate here in the UK too. But how did chocolate make it to the UK? Well, by the time that Hernan Cortes and the Spanish conquerors made it to Mexico in 1519, the beans were still being used as a currency. The Spaniards brought it back to Europe, but it still had a bitter taste often. And so they decided that mixing it with sugar would be the solution. In the 17th century, it made its way to Britain where men would drink it in parlours where they chattered and gambled. In 1847, a prominent Quaker called Joseph Fry discovered how to make it into a solid form like we know today. Um, and he did this by adding back in the cocoa butter that had been squeezed out in the process of making it into a cocoa powder. By the 1870s, condensed milk was added into the mix, resembling the chocolate that we know today. Companies like Nestle's and Cadbury's knew that they were onto something good. Although the sugar means that chocolate can add to our waistline, dark chocolate can actually prevent arteries from clogging up and even milk chocolate can help contribute to a decrease in the risk of stroke. Plus, on top of that, chocolate contains phenyl ethylamine, which actually is a chemical produced when one is in love. So that's why it gives you a bit of a feel good factor. How is chocolate made? Well, cocoa pods start off on the cocoa tree and they're a kind of maroony colour when they're ripe. And did you know that one can grow as big as a rugby ball? So they can get pretty massive indeed. They taste kind of sour at first but then they go through a process where the beans are fermented they're laid to dry out in the sun and then they go to a factory where they're sifted to get rid of all the unwanted bits there's grit and dirt and all of the stuff that we don't want to eat and then they're roasted at a low temperature which brings out the yummy chocolate flavor and then they are cracked open to give us cocoa nibs um, which are then ground into a paste, which is called cocoa mass. Some of the cocoa mass is kept for later, but there's a machine that squishes all the cocoa butter out and you get a pressed powder cake left behind, which is cocoa powder. Um, the cocoa mass we kept is mixed with the cocoa butter and sugar is added and sometimes milk and also you could add in other stuff like vanilla flavour. Next up, the chocolate goes through rollers to make it more smooth and improve the texture. And then the final process is called tempering, which is heating and cooling it so that the structure is just right and that it's nice and smooth and shiny looking when you open your chocolate bar wrapper. And then of course, the ultimate process is we eat it and it tastes amazing. Um, today's story is all about a dragon with a chocolate heart. This book is by Stephanie Burgess. The Dragon with a Chocolate Heart. Chapter One. I can't say I ever wondered what it felt like to be human, but then my grandfather, Granite, always said, it's safer not to talk to your food. And as every dragon knows, humans are the most dangerous kind of meal there is. 
Of course, as a young dragon, all I ever saw of them were their jewels and their books. The jewels were delightful, but their books were just maddening. What a waste of ink. No matter how hard I squinted, I could never make it past the first few paragraphs of cramped, crabby text. The last time I tried, I got so frustrated, I burnt three of those books to cinders with angry puffs of my breath. Don't you have any higher feelings, my brother demanded when he saw what I'd done. Jasper wanted to be a philosopher, so he always tried to stay calm, but his tail began to lash dangerously, sending gold coins showering through our cavern as he glared at the smoking pile before me. Just think, he told me, every one of those books was written by a creature whose brain was half the size of one of your forefeet, and yet, apparently, even they have more patience than you. Oh, really? I loved goading high-minded Jasper into losing his temper. And now that I'd laid waste to my tiny paper enemies, I was ready for fun. So I braced myself, scales rippling with secret delight, and said, well, I think anyone who wants to spend his time reading ant scribbles must have an ant-sized brain himself. Ugh! He let out the most satisfying roar of rage and leapt forward, landing exactly where I'd been sitting only a moment ago. If I hadn't been expecting it, I would have been slammed into a mountain of loose diamonds and emeralds, and my still soft scales would have been bruised all over. But Jasper was the one who landed there instead, while I joyously pounced on his back and rubbed his snout in the pile of rocks. Children! Our mother raised her head from her forefeet and let out a long-suffering snort that blew through the cave, sending out more gold coins flying. Some of us are trying to sleep after a long, hard hunt. I would have helped you hunt, I said, jumping off Jasper, if you'd let me come. Your scales haven't hardened enough to withstand even a wolf's bite. Mother's great head sank back down towards her glittering blue and gold feet, let alone a bullet or a magic spell, she added wearily. In another 30 years, perhaps, when you're nearly grown and ready to fly. I can't wait another 30 years, I bellowed. My voice echoed round the cave until Grandfather and both of my aunts were calling their own sleepy protests down the long tunnels of our home. But I ignored them. I can't live cooped up in this mountain forever, going nowhere, doing nothing. Jasper is using his quiet years to teach himself philosophy. Mother's voice no longer sounded weary. It grew cold and hard like a diamond as her neck stretched higher and higher above me, her giant golden eyes narrowing into dangerous slits focused solely on me, her disobedient daughter. Other dragons have found their own passions in literature, history or mathematics. Tell me, adventurine, have you managed to find your passion yet? I ground my teeth together and scratched my front-like claws through the piled gold beneath my feet. Lessons are boring. I want to explore. And, and how exactly do you plan to communicate with the creatures you meet on your explorations? Mother asked sweetly. Or have you been progressing further with your language studies than I had imagined? Jasper let out a muffled snicker behind me. I swung round and shot a ball of smoke at him. He let it explode harmlessly in his face, his eyes gleaming with amusement. I can speak six languages already, I muttered as I turned back to mother. Still, I couldn't quite lift my head to meet her gaze. By the time she was your age, mother said, your sister could speak and write twenty. Hmm. I didn't dare snort smoke at mother, but I would have snorted at its citrine if she'd been stuck here with us instead of living far away in her perfectly extraordinary, one-of-a-kind, dragon-sized palace. Citrine wrote epic poetry that filled other dragons with awe and was worshipped like a queen by every creature who came near her. No one could measure up to my older sister. There was no point even trying. I could feel Mother's gaze on me grow even sharper, as if she'd read my thoughts. Language, she said, quoting one of Jasper's favourite philosophers, is a dragon's greatest power, reaching far beyond the realm of tooth and claw. I know, I muttered. Do you really, Aventurine? Her long neck curved as her massive head swung down to look me in the eyes. Because courage is one thing, but recklessness is quite another. You may think yourself a ferocious beast, but outside this mountain you wouldn't survive a day. So you had better start being grateful that you have older and wiser relatives to look after you. Mother was sleeping deeply only two minutes later, her heavy breaths whooshing as calmly and evenly through the cabin as if we'd never even had an argument. Not a day, whispered Jasper once she was safely asleep. He shook off the last of the gemstones clinging to his back and grinned at me, showing all of his teeth. Not an hour more likely, not even half an hour knowing you. I glared at him, mantling my wings. I could look after myself perfectly well. I'm bigger and fiercer than anything else in these mountains. 
But are you smarter? He snorted. I'd wager all the gold in this cavern that even wolves are better at philosophical debates than you, and they probably don't set things on fire every time they lose. Oh, I whirled round, lashing my tail. But there was no escape. The cavern walls were too close, and feeling closer with every second, they were pushing in around me until I could barely breathe. And I was supposed to spend another 30 years trapped inside this mountain, listening to my relatives tell me off for the fact that it was boring. Never. That was when I realised exactly what I had to do. But I wasn't stupid. No matter what anyone thought. So I waited until Jasper finally gave up teasing me and curled up with one of his new human books. One that I hadn't burnt. It was a philosophical tract, so I knew I would be safe. I'm going on a walk through the tunnels, I told him when he had flicked the pages five times with his claw. Hmm, murmured Jasper without looking up. Aventurine, listen to this. This fellow thinks it's morally wrong to eat meat and fish too. He won't hurt any breathing creatures, so he only eats plants. Isn't that fascinating? Fascinating? I'm going to starve. I flicked my ears in horror. I told you humans had pebbles for brains. But my brother didn't even hear me. Smoke trickled in a long, happy stream through his nostrils as he held the tiny book close to his eyes, rumbling with satisfaction. I stepped right over his tail, one foot after another, on my way to freedom. Rattling snores echoed down the long tunnels from the caverns where Grandfather Granat, Aunt Tourmaline and Aunt Emerald slept. Luckily, at this time of day, when the sun was at its highest, no one was likely to wake at a few scrabbling steps from the corners of the mountain. Dropping to my belly, I wriggled my way up the side tunnel I'd discovered two years earlier. The one that was too small for any of the grown-ups to use. At the very top, filled and hidden by a boulder the size of my head, was a secret entrance to the mountain. It was my favourite spot in the world. I'd shown Jasper, of course, ages ago, but he almost never visited it. Only when I dragged him there. He was always happiest curled up in our cabin with a book or scratching out long wordy treatises with one foreclaw dipped in ink. I was the one who loved pushing the boulder free and poking the tip of my snout out of the hole to take deep tingling breaths of the fresh outside air and watch the clouds float through the sky overhead. I'd never dared to go any further, but I lay there for hours sometimes, just dreaming of the day when I'd finally be allowed to stretch my wings and fly across the endless sky. Today, for the first time ever, I wasn't going to stop dreaming. I was going to show Jasper and Mother just how capable I was of taking care of myself. Then the grown-ups would have no excuse to keep me hidden away any longer. With exhilaration flooding through me, I folded my wings tightly against my sides and lunged for the outside world and freedom. It was harder than I'd expected to squeeze out of the hole. My shoulders stuck in the opening until I nearly roared with effort. I had to bite my mouth shut and swallow down, choking smoke to keep myself silent. Finally, finally, I forced myself free with an explosive pop. It sent me tumbling onto the ground outside and whimpering with pain. My folded wings had scraped so hard against the rough, craggy edges of the rocks that there were ragged tears now in my silver and crimson scales. What had Mother said? Your scales haven't hardened enough to withstand even a wolf's bite. I gnashed my teeth and pushed myself up onto all four feet, babying my wings by holding them half folded at my side. Every breath that blew across them made me wince, but I growled away the pain. So I wouldn't be making my first attempt at flight today. Never mind. I didn't need to fly to catch my prey. For the first time in my life, the sky arched blue and free all around me, and I was free too. The jagged peak of the mountain rose behind me. Below me lay a forested valley, and in between, buried somewhere in the rumpled foothills and narrow rocky paths where animals and humans made their tiny ways, I set off down the mountainside, following the scent of food. The dragon with a chocolate heart. I'm assuming that's metaphorical, which means that her heart melts easily. She's emotional. But chocolate melting is something that comes in handy for what we're going to do next. I'm going to be showing you how to do chocolate writing and drawings. It's really, really easy. You may need the help of a supervising grown-up because you're going to need some boiling water in a bowl from a kettle. That's what's going to melt our chocolate which you also need obviously we're going to get a food bag to pipe out of um you will need a pair of scissors to cut the corner off the food bag and also some grease proof paper so let's kick off what we need to do is get your food bag 
and then break up your bits of chocolate and put it in. And then I'm gonna put some boiling water in my bowl. And then I'm gonna put my chocolate in. You can um, chop your chocolate up even smaller with a knife if you want, because the smaller the pieces are, the better that the chocolate melts. Okay, my chocolate has melted. Okay, so next I'm gonna put my greaseproof paper out, flat on a surface, and then get your scissors out, and then we're going to cut the very, very corner off our bag. There we go. Tiny corner size. And now I'm ready to pipe. And you can do whatever you want. Writing. Um, mm, yummy chocolate. Mmm. Mmm. Right, I'm going to do a flower picture first. Here we go. Mm -mm. You have to have quite a steady hand, but it doesn't matter if there's mistakes because wonky things look quite endearing. So there we are, I've done a flower and you could write your name. I'm going to write hello. Um, hello. I'm going to do a heart next, I think, I like doing hearts. So, ooh. oh, my heart's a bit wonky. Do a star, filling my star in just to use all my chocolate up because I'm on the last bit of chocolate. Okay, there we go. That's my wonky star. So I'm now going to give you an overhead view of what I've drawn. So here you can see what I've drawn. All that remains is for me to put this in the fridge. So it should come off really, really nicely. Let's give it a go. Oh, look, yeah, it just slips off. So there you go. I can show you. You've got a chocolate flower, essentially. That, and you can use these to decorate a cake, you know, you could ice straight onto a cake, or you can do it, I don't know if you've ever seen fancy cream cakes with a thing standing up at the top. Um, I'm gonna peel my heart off. I don't even think I need the fish slice, because that's how confident I am. There we go. There's a heart, lovely little heart, uh, and you can eat it as a treat, just like that. Um, another really good trick that you can do, there's my little star. Um, you can see another good trick that you can do is you could write people's names and then put them on their place setting at a birthday party so they find oh no I've broken my hello I got carried away chatting to you um you can put them on their place at a birthday party on their paper plate and then um then they can find their place and then eat their name I had my uh, chocolate bag still cooking around, so I put it back in the hot water and tried to repair the hello with the tiny bit left in the end. So we'll see if that's worked. The good thing about this method is you can squeeze all the chocolate out. So hardly, there's no wastage at all hardly. The more you squeeze out, the more all the chocolate is used. Here's three top tips if you are doing chocolate writing or drawings. Number one, if you don't have any greaseproof paper, a shiny plate should do the job. You can ice straight on it, but take care when spatulaing your writing and your pictures up because it could be a lot fiddlier. Number two, you could put your designs on a piece of paper and then put a glass plate over the top and then trace them. Number three, the bigger your designs, then the easier they are to do because it's very fiddly. Everything has to be joined up. So if you're doing capital letters, it's not as effective as if you're doing lowercase, if you're writing your name, for example. Or if you're doing a smiley face, the eyes won't be attached to the rest of your chocolate design, which is fine if you're transferring it onto something flat. Um, like a cake. 
but if you're just having it as a little treat to eat then your eyes and your smile won't be attached to your face so try and do things where you don't take your pen off the page to write or draw them for a two-tone design you could always use white chocolate as well here's my finished designs hope you like them hope you enjoyed the video spread the word and please subscribe